is Natasha Helper Parker, and this is Mormon Sex Info. So glad to be back with you again. I'm super excited about today's interview. Before I go there, I just want to announce a few changes that have been happening over the last few months at Mormon Sex Info. So we do have a new website, which is mormonsex.info, and that's been upgraded to be much more user friendly, I believe. Also, we've been offering all of archived sessions pretty much weekly on Apple's iTunes podcast. So if you want to follow us on Apple iTunes, you can now access all of the kind of archived sessions for free. And then we still, of course, ask for kind of suggested donations to help with the costs of keeping this podcast sustainable. So you can do that either by kind of quote unquote, purchasing the new interviews or um, just offering a yearly donation. And you can do that in several ways that, that are fairly easy to click on in regards to the website. And yearly suggestion is $35 a year, which isn't a whole lot, I hope, for most people and helps us make a big difference as far as making this sustainable. So those are some new things to be aware of. Today, I am so excited to have uh, Dr. Cameron Staley with me from Idaho State University. He's recently been getting quite a bit of attention for a TED Talk that he offered in regards to you know, this, this kind of narrative about pornography and overcoming struggles with pornography, specifically from a mindful approach and from some of the research that he's been involved with. So welcome, Dr. Staley, to the program. Thank you. It's great to be here. Really excited to have this discussion with you as we had a little chance to talk a little bit before. And as you know, I feel very passionately about this topic and I've been talking about it for a long time. So super glad to have you come on. So before we get started, really, I would just love to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself. Tell us who you are, where you work, what you're doing professionally, what's your background as far as mental health, et cetera. Yeah, so I uh, kind of grew up in the Ogden area in Utah and then went to Idaho State University to work on my PhD in clinical psychology. So I always had a strong interest just to be a kind of a general mental health practitioner and I thought when I started graduate school that I was going to work with couples. And that belief lasted until I saw my first couple. I'm like, wow, that is really hard. Um, I still work with couples, but I generally do a lot of mental health counseling. And so I've worked in university counseling centers at BYU, Idaho State, Utah State for the last, I guess, eight or nine years now. And part of the graduate program is you had to research a topic. And I thought, well, I'd probably better learn a little bit more about sexuality if I'm going to work with couples. And so kind of where my research journey started, it started in church. I was sitting there listening to someone talk about pornography and how addicting it was. And I thought, you know, that's something I've never really looked at, the research. I don't really know what it has to say about it. And so when I started to explore it, I realized there wasn't a lot of great experimental research on the impact of pornography. So I bring this up to my mentor, um, Nicole Prowsey, who came from Kinsey Institute, um, kind of the home of sex research. And I said, hey, can we study the effects of pornography? And she's like, seriously, you know, like how controversial that would be? And, and I honestly didn't. I just thought that oh, science is science. Let's study it and see. So everyone talks about it as an addiction. Let's check it out. Um, so that's kind of how I naively entered this field not really knowing all the debate and controversy and how strongly people believed in addiction. For me, I just had a question. Is pornography addictive? Mm -hmm. So we set up a, a study where we invited people in who had a history of difficulty controlling pornography viewing, and we monitored their brain activity as they viewed sexual images, nature documentaries, exciting films. And I thought that, yeah, we're gonna find evidence that porn's an addiction just like drug use. And we didn't, and that was really surprising to me. Um, so that kind of opened up um, lots of thoughts. Of, well, if it's not an addiction, what else could it be? And so a lot of my research kind of pointed to the idea that emotions are playing a pretty big role in this, that those that struggle with viewing porn often experience a lot of anxiety and disgust and shame while they view. And that fits a compulsion model um, really well, and there's good treatments for um, compulsive behaviors. So that was kind of my research journey. And then when I went to BYU, they had been running groups for pornography concerns for many, many years. 
and they use an approach called acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT. And that was my really my first experience using ACT and I found it to be really effective um, in working with pornography concerns. I love everything you just say. Can I just say, <laughs> Even, including the fact that I guess I didn't realize that uh, Dr. Prousey is your mentor because I actually have had several interactions with her. She's been on Mormon Sex Info as well. Oh, so, um, yeah. We actually wrote some op-eds uh, together for the Salt Lake Tribune and in regards to oh, sexual yeah. education with within kind of Utah public school systems and things like that that were concerning as far as some of these messages that were not backed up with research that were being kind of disseminated in you know public school arenas. So that's awesome that, that you're involved with her. I, I really enjoy her for sure. <laughs> so. Yeah, we spent a few years together in good old Pocatello trying to figure out good ways to study pornography and, and get the research out there. That's fabulous. Okay, so if, if you don't mind, before we go further in regards to a lot of kind of your findings and, and what that was like for you, uh, you mentioned, you know, sitting at church and why this was kind of like a topic that, yeah, obviously it does come up in Mormon church a lot, right? As far as people being concerned, be, people being afraid. I think it's always done with probably the best of intentions, you know, trying to help people. How, how comfortable are you just sharing your own kind of Mormon journey as far as where do you come from? How do you, how do you happen to be kind of within the Mormon community yourself? Yeah, so I, growing up in Utah, my family were members of the church. I grew up in there. And it's kind of, I guess everyone has an interesting story to tell, but um, I think I got, the older I got, the more involved um, in the church I became. I really enjoyed going to seminary, studying the Book of Mormon. Um, I grew up in a more of a non-traditional home, pretty liberal, so we didn't have a lot of family nights or there wasn't a lot of pressure to go to church. So um, kind of gaining my own testimony belief system was really on me. And so when it was that time to go on a mission, I told my folks that, you know, I, I do want to serve a mission. I, I care about my beliefs and I want to share the Book of Mormon with folks. And they were not happy with that decision. And they're like, you know, you can help in a lot of ways. Like, why don't you go to college? and I said, no, I, I truly feel a calling to, to go out there and share these things that are really precious to me. Um, so yeah, my parents were not a big fan of that decision. Um, that was hard <laughs> for them. Um, but I truly served a mission because it was something that I cared about, that I value. Hmm. So my faith has been very central to me throughout my life. And, and I would say it's definitely evolved. And being a psychologist has probably contributed to that evolution. I think working with a lot of people with different backgrounds, um, working with a lot of sexual minority individuals, racial minority individuals, mm -hmm. I recognize my privilege and opportunities way more than I did kind of growing up. And so I think um, my faith in many ways has become a lot stronger. Um, and then other things that are more kind of culturally based, I've been able to kind of let go a little bit more. Yeah, very much it's something I care about. I'm still very much active in the church. And, and hold more callings than I probably would <laughs> volunteer for, but I'm, I'm always <laughs> happy to help people and serve people. And for me, that fits kind of my style as a psychologist and as a missionary. Um, I, I just really want to help people's lives be better. Yeah. And those are covenants that I've made, and I'm going to mourn with those that mourn and sit with those that have been marginalized. Like those that don't have a voice, they're my people. Mm -hmm. um, so those are people that I care about deeply. Thank you so much for that. That was really touching. And kind of along with the with that kind of feel, uh, I because that's a lot of how I felt as well as as we we start hearing these concerns in specific with what you've researched about pornography. You're sitting both at church as a member yourself. You're probably having your own sexual experience, which that's your personal private business. And then you're also, you know, dealing with a lot of students, it sounds like professionally. So in your perspective, what are maybe some of the concerns that you started having about how our particular community was dealing with this problem? Or maybe you didn't have those concerns until maybe after your research. So can you talk a little bit about just how our community deals with the fear, the porn panic per se, in regards to whether or not that helps us actually change our behavior. Yeah, and I, I think that has been very gradual for me too. So when I started to study pornography in graduate school, um, I didn't really work with anybody in a counseling or therapy context struggling with porn. 
they didn't really know anybody. Um, I'm a little older, so I didn't grow up with technology or smartphones. So I never viewed pornography as an adolescent or a kid. That just wasn't something that I was involved in. So I didn't really know a lot about how it impacted people personally until I went to BYU. And then it was everywhere all the time. And it's like, wow, this is like a significant issue for a lot of people here. And so that was new for me. So that came way after my research. So in graduate school, I was more like, I just want to understand the phenomenon and see what is really going on. I'm seeing and how is showing it up? Like, like when you say that it was all over the place, like in what ways was it people talking about it, people showing up at the counseling centers and what do you mean by showing up? Yeah, I guess what I mean is, so I worked at the counseling center there and it was a really common presenting concern. Mm -hmm. um, so we had several groups a semester just for pornography concerns down there. So that was new for me. I, I didn't know that this was something that people came to therapy for. Um, so really common concern down there. So that was, I think, a really rapid education. Um, so fortunately, the folks there at BYU had really good colleagues um, that had been doing this for many, many years and had been running these acceptance and commitment therapy groups for many years. So I had good mentors there that could kind of guide me through it because it was new for me. So I didn't, I don't think I spent a lot of time thinking about the type of person that may look at pornography. It just wasn't something that crossed my mind. Um, but as I worked with folks, I discovered that there were some really common patterns um, that it seemed like people that were maybe a little more religious, um, a little more sensitive to emotions, a really strong desire to be obedient, do the right thing, and really kind hearted people. I mean, they were the ones quoting conference talks and scriptures left and right. And it's like, I know this is a religious institution, um, but folks that were higher on that kind of level of religion seemed to struggle more with pornography. And that was very different than maybe what I would have assumed. Um, but it seemed like people that were working really hard were maybe a little more susceptible to hearing messages about um, how terrible or dangerous it might be. So it seemed like that those fear-based shame messages maybe bounced off a lot of people and didn't impact them. But for some groups, I think it made it even more likely that they would struggle with pornography. Yeah, and I've noticed that trend as well over the years, which is what is unnecessarily tragic to me, right? Is that it's almost like our best, our most devout, our mm. most you know committed people are the ones that probably are dealing with some level of perfectionism as well, yeah. and therefore very hard on themselves, you know, interpret the same. You, know, you can have like a spectrum of LDS folks listening to a certain talk. Like I just, I just have this vision of like a few teenagers, if you had 10 teenagers listening to a talk, I'm guessing, you know, like several of them would be like rolling their eyes, they're bored, you know, they're like these old people, what the heck do they know? <laughs> Are, are able to dismiss things that maybe they don't agree with. And then you've got, you know, the wide-eyed kind of, you know, capturing every word, writing down their notes, you know, mm. wanting to be the good kids. And not that any of those kids are quote unquote bad or good, but it's just how they interpret or how they see their own righteousness according to, I think, behavioral worthiness, which is something that for good or bad, we tend to be a culture that you know, puts a lot of worthiness ideas in conjunction with behavior, certain behaviors. So then, you know, people can struggle with, if I need to be perfect on something, then they can even struggle with it more. So can you talk a little bit about that? Like, what did you find out when we, when we think about like anxiety feedback loops? What, what does that mean? How do you explain that to people? Yeah. What and for me, that, that that's, that's the big pathway. So BYU is a very rigorous university, really high achieving folks. Um, the level of stress and anxiety and perfectionism there was off the charts. I had just never experienced that before. And that seemed to be a pretty big pathway where these are people that are very driven, um, very maybe externally motivated, where sometimes faith was more uh, getting your home teaching done and making sure you're going to all your meetings and, and kind of checking off a lot of boxes and maybe less comfortable with the emotions and maybe some of the values or intrinsic meaning behind the faith. And so when I saw that just anxiety, that pressure, that stress, we end up trying to find ways to cope with that. And for many people, it's eating, drugs, over-exercising. Um, but for a lot of folks, it's viewing sexual images 
that's something they found that kind of helped them check out from that stress and pressure momentarily, but then just contributed to profound feelings of guilt and shame. And then we turned back to viewing sexual images and masturbating again to cope with that. So for me, that was that compulsive pattern that I saw over and over that these were really good people, but also kind of had a belief that that you can control things internally. Like I can control my anxiety, I can control sexual urges, but the opposite is more true. Um, the more you try to control those things, the less control we have and it seems to spiral. Um, but it, it seemed to all come from a place of, I'm just trying to do the right thing. And that backfired for folks. And that was painful to witness that over and over. And it's been hard for me to see people have that kind of rock their own faith and belief system where they've engaged in like addiction recovery programs and they haven't worked for them. And then they determine, well, the church isn't true. My beliefs must not be true. And I'm like, oh no, let's, let's slow down for a second here. Um, just because that approach didn't work for you doesn't mean all the things you believe and care about aren't true. Um, that just may not be an evidence-based approach that's as effective. And so I, I think I developed a kind of a soft spot, maybe a little protective part of my heart where people struggling with pornography are a vulnerable group. And those messages are negatively impacting them. And we need to maybe talk about pornography in a different way and advocate for better evidence-based treatments to help some really good people just struggling with a compulsive behavior. Are you aware of other types of research that would really apply to our population, to the vulnerability of the Mormon population in regards to these kinds of issues? Yeah, I think um, Josh Grubbs, he does a lot of good work in this area, kind of looking at the role of religion and beliefs around sexuality and pornography specifically. And some of his work has been really informative. Um, he's looked at people that believe that they are addicted. Um, that, that, that might be a part of why they continue to struggle, just having that belief. And those that have a really strong moral opposition to viewing pornography or discomfort around sexuality um, may also struggle a little bit more. So we found that people that are religious are a lot more likely to perceive they're addicted, even though they're not necessarily viewing at higher rates. Because um, generally speaking, being religious is a bit of a protective factor. You tend to see lower rates of viewing sexual Im images generally. Um, but for some folks, um, that may put them a bit more of at risk, just really struggling with, oh, I have sexual urges. These must be really bad. Um, I viewed sexual images. Something must be really wrong. And just that fear ramps up that cycle that we see. Yeah, I was, I'm so glad you mentioned him because that's exactly who I was thinking of. I, I think it is really interesting when you think about this concept that this whole this whole conversation affects religious people differently than it affects mm -hmm. non-religious or, or maybe religious people who don't have the same level of rigidity around some of these values or standards, right? And, and I would say even more standards. I think most people have values that have to do with sexual responsibility and sexual pleasure and sexual health, but how we determine certain behaviors <laughs> that align with those values could be really different depending on the certain religious tradition you come from. So this is where I, I think, you know, I, I often talk about how cocaine doesn't care if you're Mormon or not, but pornography does, <laughs> you know, <laughs> It doesn't really matter what your values or your beliefs are around cocaine. It kind of affects everybody the same. <laughs> but pornography, we see a big difference. And so here's where I'd like to tease out a conversation I, I don't know that I've necessarily had yet with anybody. So bear with me here. But, you know, you bring up the compulsive, the compulsive model versus the addiction model, which I completely agree with. And that's how I've been talking about it for many years as well. Compuls compulsive, impulsive issues, compulsive issues, obsessive thoughts, you know, things of that nature, which all kind of have to do with diagnostic areas around anxiety. At the same time, if we're going to look at the fact that people outside of Mormonism, people outside of kind of high demand religious structures are looking at pornography oftentimes more than we are as a culture, and they are not being diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder, or compulsivity, they're not even going in, they're not distressed about it, right? They're not, you know, if they watch porn once a day or once a week, or 
A lot of couples even watch porn together. These are not things that, in fact, a lot of them find these things edifying in their relationships for other reasons, other values that they may have. I'm, I'm a little concerned that we may also, even though I think the compulsive impulsive models are much more helpful and accurate, that we have models at all. We don't really have a lot of room in the Mormon discussion to just say, you know what? For some people, this is just fun. Yeah. This is just fun behavior. Now you may feel guilty about it being fun, right? About it being pleasurable. And I do think that we have kind of a zero sum game with pornography in Mormonism. It's not like if I go in and talk to my bishop, for example, and say, hey, I've been yelling at my kids more than I should. And I think I've got some anger management issues and he might listen and maybe even put me on a repentance track of some sort. And if I come in and say, you know what, I'm doing a lot better. I yelled at my kids like probably 50% less this week. He'd be like, that's phenomenal, right? Good for you, right? But I don't know that we can have the same necessarily conversation around pornography with either ecclesiastical leaders or even spouses who have certain expectations around Mormon marriage, you know, where oh, I've decreased my behavior by 50%. Great, we can live with that. You know, it's, it's really most people are really heading for if, if you're going to talk about overcoming a pornography struggle, what that typically means the definition of that is we're never going to be looking at pornography again so i don't know if you have any thoughts about that oh i've got a few um <laughs> i think about i've got a colleague at idaho state dj williams um, that's done a lot of research in this area and another good model to look at any behavior is from a, a leisure activity model that that some folks are engaging in activities for a form of entertainment and so many people out there are probably looking at sexual images as entertainment, um, just like you would watching NFL on the weekends um, or like to sample different types of fine foods. It's, it really fits kind of that leisure activity model. And so I think there's a spectrum that for some people, they can view sexual images and it's not compulsive in nature. It's not addictive in nature. Um, it's a form of entertainment. And I think when it's, consensual and you're aware of it and you have overall good healthy relationships it's probably not going to be a major problem in many people's lives i think for others where it is like this is cons inconsistent with my standards my beliefs um, and kind of impacts my ability to live my faith um, in the way that i want to then it be becomes more of a challenge and i think i do take more of that instead of but we got to eliminate this completely um, I found that that can backfire for a lot of folks, that pressure of this can never happen, I can never view again. It's almost like that pressure builds up until they view pornography or they call it a relapse. And it's like all those days that you've been working and making progress are like wiped out. And then they start over again and then they feel terrible. And it's like, oh, back to square zero or ground zero. And for me, I think about, I'm more focused on development and progression and learning from our experiences and so for me that's why i've appreciated the acceptance and commitment therapy model is it's not focused on eliminating a behavior the goal of act is not to stop pornography viewing um, that's an outcome of act but that's not the goal the goal instead is how can we clarify your values and begin living with those more consistently so instead of spending your time trying to control sexual urges, let's spend your time cultivating your faith, building your relationships, pursuing your education, enhancing your career. And often the more we do that, the more purpose and fulfillment and connection that we have, and the less need we have to soothe ourselves in ways such as viewing sexual images. But it's the focus. So I think about wherever we put our focus, that tends to grow. Whatever we water grows. So if we're trying to water this, I got to struggle with sexual urges, that's going to keep being a pretty prominent part of your life. But if we shift that focus to, I want to grow a life that I care about that matters to me, and that grows. And I've seen that shift occur pretty quickly and pornography concerns start to dissolve pretty readily. And we just shift that focus to, let's take all that time and energy that you've devoted to controlling urges to actually living the life that you want. 
yeah, I, I love all of that. I, I'm very close friends and actually do quite a bit of professional work with uh, my colleague, Dr. John Dillon, who also very much comes from the ACT model. And mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about these issues, he'll say very similar things. Uh, he has this little exercise about the pink elephant. You know, if you, yeah. you know, he'll, he'll show a, a picture of a pink elephant. And he said, how many of you have thought about this pink elephant before today? <laughs> and everybody says, no, we haven't. So he's like, so you're experts in not thinking about this pink elephant, but for the next five minutes, I'm going to try to get you to not think about the pink elephant. <laughs> and of course, everybody's thinking about it, right? Because it's right in front of your face. And so I think that has been kind of one of the tragic kind of cultural things that we've seen around pornography is because it's been kind of this panic anxiety response to it. And we keep bringing it up. We bring it up at church. We bring it up in general conference. We bring it up in the enzyme. We bring it up you know, we tell people to monitor it at home and have family home evenings about it. Boy, now you're thinking about it a whole lot more than you ever would have thought about it, you know, prior. And, and of course, that's to be balanced with, of course, we do want to have some conversations around yeah. anything, you know, that we have. I mean, I think pornography is something that is important to talk to your kids about and have family discussions about. And have what Marty Klein calls porn literacy types of Absolutely. checklists, right? and yet not go too far on the pendulum of just, it's this constant focus, <laughs> like you're yeah. saying. Yeah, well, and I appreciate you talking about the leisure model because I think that one of the things that I would like to help the Mormon community understand is that just because it goes against our values doesn't mean that it's necessarily a disease or that it has clinical sickness implications, right? Yeah. And I think, unfortunately, those two things have been very partnered in our Mormon community and why the addiction model has, not only in Mormonism, but I, you know, I come from evangelical kind of Bible Belt areas, and I saw a lot of that same, you know, kind of addiction treatment centers and things of that nature, which, to your point, research doesn't corroborate, and there's no, like, um, peer-reviewed um, results that this is a, an effective treatment, you know, to reduce. In fact, sometimes we can see the opposite. Plus my main concern is that it's a, it's a diseased model towards your sexuality. Yeah. And I really find that very problematic. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah. And for me, that's where the shift needs to go instead of on pornography to let's talk about healthy sexuality and promote those conversations um, with our children or youth. And I think a lot of it even comes before that about we're just uncomfortable just even having a body and we just have a lot of shame about that and so we don't talk about that and then people are just kids are curious about bodies and they look up things online and and then they're not prepared for those sexual urges and there's not a place to talk to your folks about that that hey i just i don't know a lot about my body and i don't know a lot about sexuality and i saw some things and i felt things and i don't know what's going on and, and then usually when you do talk to parents it's it's met with a lot of fear. We're not going to talk about this or this is really bad. And I think for the folks I've worked with, they start to view pornography around like eight to 12 mm -hmm. and without any guidance for such a strong drive that, that most of us have. I think about the analogy that I shared probably in that Ted talk was the analogy of the river that we've got this really powerful part of us um, just like a river. And yet we're so afraid of it that we're like, I'm never going to tell my kids about a river or teach them how to swim and that rivers even exist. And, and then when they find it, they go in the river and it can be dangerous if you don't really know what it is. Or, and I think about, I would never just leave my little kids by a stream. Like I'd take them to swim lessons and teach them about it. And rivers can be really fun and connecting. And when you're mature and ready and have the proper equipment and have some good guides, I think sexuality is the same way. So I think is, is the more we prepare people about just normal, healthy sexuality, I um, mean, then, yeah, include literacy around pornography, that pornography is not sex education, and this is not realistic. These are actors. This is, these people may not be even enjoying what they're doing. This is Hollywood. This is movies. This isn't real. Um, having that literacy is really key. I think the more we just have quality education, the less of a concern we're going to see with people getting stuck with pornography. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then it, it would be nice if there was room for sexual explicit materials to be part of education or even coupled sexuality concerns. For example, there are quite a few sexual education companies that produce sexually explicit films to help educate, you know, that are not necessarily from 
you know, Pornhub or some of these other um, yeah. kind of porn industries, but that are specifically for the purpose of education. And those can be very helpful. And even just a, a program like omgs.com, you know, is, is fabulous. It's really helping women understand their potential for orgasm and well, that's awesome. certain techniques, you know, and things like that. But they do have some sexually explicit videos that show a woman exactly how to you know, position herself or touch herself or have her partner touch her. And I found a lot of Mormon couples that I work with have found resources like that very helpful. And so how do we, again, you know, maybe from our, from our kind of tradition, I always have liked the scripture, you know, by the fruits, you shall know them. And so Mm -hmm. can certain things edify my relationship with sexual health or our relationship as a couple sexually, instead of just seeing something as, you know, and, inherently bad or good, you know, and and some of the examples I give about this are like even missionary style position sex, which most people seem to think is normal sex can be used in really bad ways. (laughs) And of course it can be used in really wonderful ways, right? So that doesn't inherently make missionary position sex bad or good. So how is it used in what context, under what values, you know, what's, what's the result. And I think sometimes, you know, if we could even make that shift towards sexually explicit materials, that might be a helpful reframe. Yeah, that would be amazing. I think about, it's all about the intention, the purpose behind what we're doing. And I think um, having healthy models for sexuality could be really meaningful for couples. And so viewing sexual images could enhance intimacy and connection and provide education. Um, That for me could be a a quality um, purpose. Um, And that can be very different than a lot of the pornography that we see out there. So for me, it's all about the intention and the purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And then whether or not a couple's more, you know, kind of mired in these secrecy, betrayal types of patterns, because of course, usually like you're mentioning, if a young kid is looking at something ages eight to 12, a lot of times we're not comfortable going to talk to our parents, or if we do, if the response is fear-based and discipline-based, you're now getting dragged into the bishop's office. (laughs) You're now, you know, not able to pass the sacrament. You're now embarrassed in front of your friends or all of that can kind of push forward this unfortunate, like you're saying, fear, anxiety loop. And also I think people learn how to start being more secretive, unfortunately, which then can affect their future relationship with a spouse, right? I'm not, I'm afraid to tell you this. What if you leave me? What if you're disappointed? What if you don't want to be with me anymore. I don't want to hurt you. And that, you know, in my experience, especially in couples work, that's, it's a very common theme is the secrecy and the betrayal of the secrecy. I agree. And I think the secrecy just contributes to those feelings of shame. It contributes to disconnection and withdraw um, because there's not space to talk about this or have a conversation, or there's that fear of just punishment or people being critical or judgmental. So for me, the the answer to that, the solution is connection and openness and sharing. So if I think about it from a kind of a religious standpoint, I think about Christ, the Savior's teaching has come to me. Um, Let's talk. Um, I'm here for you. My arms are always stretched out. Whereas the adversary would say, go hide. Um, Don't tell anybody. Like, keep this a secret. Feel really bad about it. And so I think I see that same pathway with pornography. It's like, no, Mm -hmm. turn to people. Um, but we feel like, no, we did something terrible. We need to withdraw. And that's kind of what we do as children when we feel like we've done something bad is we want to hide. Mm-hmm. Um, but as something as important and significant as sexuality, we really do need to turn towards people who can be good mentors, that can guide us, um, but definitely our partners and our parents um, to be able to get help to understand how to navigate sexuality. And, and I think there's a learning process there. And with anything that's new and challenging and powerful, you're going to make some mistakes and have some missteps. That's just part of learning. So creating a little more space to learn something that's so important. I think that would allow people to breathe a little bit and and not panic where it's like, I think I saw something and did something. It's like, yep, you're learning how to manage arousal and a drive and that's okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And just like we've taught people to be secretive in a way, you know, because we've we, whenever you respond with fear and, and discipline, people tend to go inward. I think we've also taught people to be afraid. In other words, on the other side of that equation, if you're a wife or a husband and your partner's coming to you with this information, you've been taught to 
feel betrayed, to mm. see it as a huge problem, to talk to your bishop and start this kind of disciplined fear-based approach to this. And so I think there's room for both, you know, for those who are struggling with it, that the invitation is to start learning how to be more open. For those who are on the other side of that, the invitation is to be more accepting, right? And to not necessarily give in to those fear narratives and to just listen and offer support and love and and if you're having some of those feelings to understand that it's normal to have those betrayed feelings, but to not necessarily believe them all the time. Like that's, that's actually like your, you know, your partner doesn't love you or doesn't care about you. Those, that's probably not the story, right? There's a more complex cultural story here that we're all being affected by. Yeah. So you've mentioned ACT several times. So why don't we finish out the interview by kind of maybe you giving some ideas or suggestions of what that actually looks like in you know, day-to-day lives as far as how people might incorporate some of those strategies and tips and theoretical framings to help them in their day-to-day lives. You talked yeah, about so, reading, I think, in your in your TED Talk. Yeah. So ACT, it's been around for about 30 years now. Um, so it really comes out of that cognitive behavioral tradition. Um, but what makes ACT unique is it infuses a lot of mindfulness. So instead of trying to change thoughts and emotions with ACT, we're more trying to increase awareness of thoughts, emotions, and urges. Instead of trying to change them or control them or get rid of them, we're trying to create space for them and understand them, that our thoughts, emotions, and urges, they're not the problem. It's our struggle with them that actually becomes the problem. So when you notice an urge to view pornography, Instead of just following that urge and viewing porn and then feeling bad about it, take a moment to say, okay, I'm noticing that urge. You know, where am I right now? How am I feeling? How has my day gone so far? And I'm amazed nine times out of 10, um, it's not a sexual urge that precedes viewing porn. It's an emotion. And often it's like, I'm feeling really overwhelmed or I feel really sad. I'm really lonely. For many people, I'm just bored. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay. So once you understand what that emotion is, you can sit with that. You can make space for it. You don't need to act on that. Um, or if you're feeling lonely, you can reach out to somebody and develop connection. So I think slowing down, just being aware of thoughts, emotions, and urges allows you to exercise your agency. Um, actually make choices that are consistent with what you want to do. So that's a big part of act is we got to slow down and start to notice what's going on there. And that's something I've found in research is those that struggle with pornography score lower on what they call trait mindfulness. Um, They just tend to be less aware of thoughts, emotions in their own body. Mm -hmm. That's where I start is let's slow down, be more aware. And then from there, instead of spending all this time and energy trying to get rid of something, let's start to focus on what is this life that you want? What do you want your relationships to look like? What are your values? What is your purpose? And for many people, that's kind of taken such a back seat that they're not really sure um, where they're going in life or what really matters to them. So the more we clarify that and start working on that, I see a pretty major shift and it's fun to see it where initially people come in and say, I viewed pornography an hour this week or 10 hours this, this week to, hey, I really focused on my relationships and studying things I cared about and praying because I care about my relationship with God. And then I'll ask him like, what about that porn thing? Like, oh, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, Cause you're living your life. Right. Um, so that's, that's the beauty of act is the more we get into our life, the things we struggle with kind of start to resolve, but we're programmed with this mentality that we've got to fix things first and then start to live the life we want. And act really says, let's shift that to, Let's live our life now. And those things we're struggling with can either come along for the ride or start to take care of themselves. Um, So that's kind of how I view ACT. So it starts with increasing awareness and really pursuing your values. I love that. And and I think too that there's some, in a way, when you talk about mindfulness, there's some real gems that we can take even from kind of Eastern philosophies or Buddhist philosophies, kind of these more acceptance rituals and just kind of, you know, I think about the tug of war metaphor, letting go of the rope instead of continuing to fight the monster, right? Or just having mantras or breathing exercises that help you kind of just recalibrate, (laughs) come back to yourself. And some of those things can feel really corny or silly even, you know, when we're not used to doing them. (laughs) 
<laughs> and so I was just tease people. It's okay to feel a little corny at first, you know, when you're repeating a mantra to yourself in the mirror. There's like a Saturday night skit that makes fun of that, right? Like you're, you're gonna tell yourself a mantra, but those things can really help rewire the way you're used to thinking about something, right? And yeah, it's so necessary. Brain habits. Yeah, and I think that's one thing I've found with those that start with porn is they're very serious about this. This is really important. And so introducing a little more humor, a little more flexibility can go a really long way. And I think for me, this, this can be a fairly simple process. So the last year I started to develop an online self-directed program for pornography based on ACT. So I put together lifeafterpornography.com and it's a 10 module series that just it's videos of me going through all these act components and lessons and principles. And my hope is that people can get a lot of benefit and just by practicing things like the tug of war and those mantras and thinking about your relationship with your thoughts and focusing on your values. So that's my hope is to make these principles more accessible um, because we know that they're helpful. And so I tried to make it that you can do it on your own. You don't even need to come in to therapy. I tried to make it less than the cost of a single therapy session. And some people may need more than this because I found that folks that struggle with porn may also struggle with things like an anxiety disorder or have a trauma in their background. But I wanted to give people just a framework to begin working with pornography. And so I hope that that program will be helpful for people just as a place to start. That's awesome. So that's lifeafterpornography.com. We'll make sure to link to that and, and direct people to that for sure. Awesome. All right. So my, my question that I always end with is what am I not asking you? What am I not bringing up that you'd love to talk about or that I haven't addressed yet? Is there anything that you want to make sure gets, gets included in this, in this discussion? I think the biggest thing is I think we would do a lot better if we had more oh. compassion for ourselves and for other people. I don't think we recognize how challenging life really is. And I think that we're all doing our best all the time. And sometimes that doesn't look the best and we need some support. We need some help and we're all struggling and we're trying to find ways to cope with significant challenges in this life. And some people found pornography, others struggle with eating or substance use um, or self-harm. Um, but really those are efforts to try to help us cope through some challenging things. And I think people would do a lot better if we were a little more kind to ourselves and one another and more understanding. And I even think that those that, you know, really strongly believe in addiction programs and that effort are doing their best to help too. I think they're all well-intended. So I think sometimes I struggle with, I don't really enjoy debates about, is this an addiction or not? I'm like, I honestly, that's not what I'm here for. I, I just want to be able to be helpful for those that are struggling and just being a little more kind, a little more understanding and be patient with our own growth. And I think that would go so far. So I know that's, that's very aspirational. That's an ideal world, <laughs> but having a little more kindness towards yourself and other people is going to be a huge part in helping us come together, especially around something as important as sexuality. Mm. I'm so glad you ended on that note. I always love when we can end on a, on a note of grace. And, and I think that's, the best part of our Mormon tradition is the belief in, you know, Christ's teachings and how he kind of trumped all other commands by yeah. these commandments, yeah. right? That had to do with love and kindness and, and even mentions others and self. <laughs> and so I think that that's, it's difficult to practice kind of some of the best stuff in our own religious tradition. And yet it's so powerful when that can happen. So so glad you ended on that note. So glad that you were able to join me today. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. So yeah, it's um, great to get to know you and uh, enjoyed our chat with you. Absolutely. Yeah. So for those of you who are listening, this is Mormon Sex Info Podcast. Again, you can find us at mormonsex.info. You can find us here on this Facebook page. Uh, you can also find us on Apple uh, iTunes podcast. So make sure you subscribe to those things or like our page. Feel free to share uh, our information with others that you might find this helpful to. And if you can support us financially, that would be amazing. We need your financial support to keep this podcast sustainable and hope that you all have a 
healthy and sexual health principled week. How about that? <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. We took the long road home Turned minutes into miles And as the evening traveled on The sunset bathed your smile We stopped beneath the desert stars Wrapped in each other's arms was as simple as I love you An ordinary, extraordinary truth It's been a long road here A trail If sometimes we fell apart, we always came back home. Was as simple as I love you, an ordinary, extraordinary. As simple as our love is That's how I wanna go All wrapped up in the arms of Our extraordinary It's nothing